We have some big flare players that are growing in Earth view and a big solar storm launch that could give Earth a glancing blow. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is really picking up in activity. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, there are a lot of regions in Earth view, and we've been following the big flare players. In fact, region 3869 is finally rotating to the sun's west limb after giving us a bit of uh, big flare activity over this past week. We also have region 3878, which continues to give us some big flares. But the one that's taken center stage is region 3883. Watch it. Pow! Right there. It fires off an M a near M4 class flare along with a big solar storm. In fact, as we take a look at it in stereo coronagraphs, you can watch this very dense structure move off to the northeast. And it looks pretty much like this one's going to miss Earth. However, when we follow it in and look at the blast wave more carefully, wow, you can see that big blast wave going off like that. And you can actually see some of the dimming regions are actually in the Earth strike zone. So this particular solar storm might actually have an Earth-directed component. So we're going to be paying close attention to region 3884 as it continues to rotate in through the Earth strike zone because this region is still firing big solar flares and it could have more Earth-directed solar storms. And now as we switch to our sun's far side, we no longer have any spacecraft that are looking at the sun's far side, at least not for the moment. So we need to switch to a uh, simulated far side using AIA and HMI imagery of about two weeks ago to see what kind of sunspots might be lurking there. And as we take a look, we can see regions 3859, 3860, and 3857. These are the regions that have been rotating into Earth view on the east limb. In fact, I think region 3859 is likely the new region 38. 83. But as we take a look at our JSOC HMI helioseismology far-sided viewer, you can see region 3860 as it rotated to the sun's far side back on the 25th, and it continues to grow. So this whole set of regions, even you can even see a little bit of activity here as well. These regions are going to be rotating into Earth view here over the next three or four days. And so that does mean we're going to have some more activity. We've got a few big flare regions that could give us more, keep that solar flux high and keep uh, big flares on the menu. But then we've got a break. Do you notice this? We've got about a, a break of probably three or four days where things might begin to quiet down. So if we can kind of get through the mess that we've got right here, then we might settle down in about uh, seven to 10 days for a bit of a break before things get really crazy with all those older regions that rotate back into Earth view with region 3869 leading the charge. And now returning to that solar storm that could be on its way to Earth, we take a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as I set this solar storm model in motion, you'll see that storm being launched pretty much to the east of Earth. But it does look like just the tail end of this structure does hit Earth right about or late on the 6th, early into the 7th, uh, NOAA's expecting it to be about 2 o'clock uh, UTC time on the 7th. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could probably get a little bit of a show. But if we switch to the NASA version of the model, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. As I set this model in motion, you can see again that solar storm being launched. But at this time, it looks like it's moving a little bit more quickly. In fact, NASA has this uh, so storm hitting us about midday on the 6th. And so if the storm hits on the 6th, then it could be a little bit more intense of a blow, which could give us a bit more of an aurora show. But somewhere in that window between about midday on the 6th and early into the 7th, we could expect to see just a little bit. But I'm only expecting aurora photography 
photographers at high latitudes to get a decent show from this. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, you know, stay on your toes, but likely you're going to need to sit this one out. Now, switching to our moon, we are coming out of a new moon and on our way to the first quarter. And by the 10th, the moon will be about 64% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, well, now is your perfect chance. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that solar storm glancing blow from that uh, solar storm that launched pretty much off the east limb. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to minor storm conditions with up to about a 20 to 25 percent chance of a major storm. Again, only if the storm ends up impacting us because it could easily miss us off to the east. But then after that, things should be settling down. We will be going into a wind watch starting around November 9th. We could get a little bit of fast solar wind. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a chance for some decent aurora. Now, aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, things are looking not quite as exciting for you. We're only expecting unsettled to active conditions, probably active conditions right around the 7th from this solar storm, with only about a 10 to 15% chance of a minor storm. And then things will settle down quite quickly. But we are, again, looking for that fast solar wind starting around the 9th. So we could get a little bit of a roar from that in case we don't get anything on Wednesday or Thursday. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with quite a few X flare players on the Earth facing disk. That's why our solar flux is high. We're sitting in the mid 230s right now, and that was likely going to continue. We're sitting also at severe noise level for radio bands on Earth's dayside. NOAA's giving us about an 80% chance of M1 or M class flares at R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even up to about a 35% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. And these conditions will easily continue over the next few days. We are seeing region 3869 rotate to the sun's far side. But then again, region 3883 is a quite a big flare player in of its own right. So likely these conditions will continue throughout this week. But if we can make it through this week, things will begin to calm down as we roll into next week. And now as we switch to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything now is in the D1 normal range. We finally settled down from the big S1 and S2 radiation storms of last week. This is at flight level 360, so you aviators, everything is finally back to normal. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. But right now we've got about a 15% chance of an S1 to S2 level radiation storm because of all the big flare players in Earth view, including region 3869, which is still rotating to the sun's west limb. So we're going to have that risk for a little while. It will calm down a bit as we move in through the weekend and likely it's going to stay about the same. Looks like things are going to be okay. We're not going to have too much issue with radiation storms over this next week, but you have to pay attention to those IKO advisories because we do still have those big flare players. And with some of these new regions rotating into Earth view, we'll have to see how they pan out. So the space weather this week is picking up in activity a bit. We do have a really dense solar storm that looks like the bulk of it has been launched to the east of Earth, but it does look like there could be an Earth-directed component. So roar photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show if we end up uh, getting a glancing blow by this solar storm. But roar photographers at mid-latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you chase. And now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we do still have some big flare players in Earth view. So even though we're saying goodbye to region 3869, big X flares and uh, R3 level radio blackouts are still on the menu. So you're going to get a lot of noise on the dayside radio bands. And maybe sometime next week, things will be calming down a little bit. So just hang in there. And now for you GPS users, well, we do have that solar storm that could have that Earth-directed component. So if you're on the night side of Earth and we do get a glancing blow from that solar storm and you're at high latitudes, just understand that you could have some dicey reception. But hey, at least the, the radiation storms have died down so you don't have to worry so much about navigation issues up near the poles. And then on Earth's day side, well, we still have those big flares that pop off every now and again. So be sure to stay vigilant at dawn or at dusk because that's where your GPS reception could be a little bit off. 
I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.